So I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the theme of uh, this session, how you connect budgeting to results. And uh, the not so subversive idea I have is that you don't need a formal budget system which strives to connect the machinery of budgeting to results in order to improve uh, development outcomes. I know this is a somewhat a deviation from the uh, from the, the received gospel, but I like to say that even the gospel had four versions, and so this is at least only one of them. Uh, so uh, I, I noticed the the delay in the in the audience response, and uh, have most welcome, especially for the parts of my presentation that you would disagree with. So uh, okay. Uh, it seems to me that the biggest problem of uh, results-based budgeting in producing results is that it actually is disconnected from experience. Uh, we design an agenda for reform not because we've looked at the way countries have developed. We don't look at the distribution of poverty. We don't look at the condition of housing. We don't look at the um, possibility of roads, the safety of water. What we look at is the machinery of budgeting. And there's a simple explanation for why we shut off our eyes when we're concerned about development from what's happening outside the four walls of the budget process. And the main reason for that is that budget reform is driven not by experience, but it's driven by reason. A sense of what's good, what's right, what's correct, in other words, it's a rational, or if you prefer, a rationalist approach uh, to reform. Okay. And uh, this rational approach is itself uh, dominated by the notion that if you have a good process, you will inevitably produce good results. Elsewhere, I've defined this as uh, due process in budgeting, which is similar or parallel to due process in judicial systems. Uh, we don't know whether the verdict of a of a court proceeding is correct on the basis of, uh, of who is right, who is wrong. We base our judgment on the process by which the verdict was reached. Uh, were the parties adequately represented? Did they, uh, was the jury tainted? Did they have an opportunity to state the case? Was your judge biased or fair? All of these are elements of due process. And we impute from the process of judicial proceedings to the correctness of the outcome. We have no other means, that is, for determining whether the uh, parties have been properly, uh, or the issues have been properly adjudicated. Okay. And we carry this over to budgeting, and I might say to many other fields of life as well. So consequently, rational reforms, since they cannot be tested in terms of the outcomes, but must be tested in terms of the process itself, tend to be self-justifying. It's not necessarily uh, necessary to assess the suitability for particular countries or whether effective in some arenas and some situations or others. The process can be carried across national boundaries. It can carry it across sectors within national boundaries. It can carry to rich communities, to poor communities, all of them have the same concept of a due process driven on the concept of what is rational. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at three uh, major TFM reforms of recent years to show how this rational attitude has actually shaped the agenda and the demands of the donor community for developing countries. First, fiscal rules, a fiscal rule that constrains key aggregates. Uh, total spending, uh, the burden of debt, the size of the deficit, etc. Okay, that deems sensible because government obviously is more disciplined if it constrains aggregate budget aggregates before spending bids are actually presented. The alternative, which we generally call bottom up, is that uh, uh, agents have a uh, uh, right uh, to. Uh, uh, present open-ended demands on government. And uh, logic would tell us that open-ended demands add up to budget totals, which 
then tend to be unacceptable or unsustainable. So the solution is let's impose fiscal rules, a top-down approach, and consequently um, the, uh, the uh, uh, agencies will not be able to ask what they want. They are constrained by those, by those rules, and therefore we assume or conclude that the outcomes will be more favorable. Uh, this logic, I might say, drove uh, before the global crisis close to 100 countries in the world, uh, uh, led by the member countries of the EU, to develop uh, uh, fiscal rules. And uh, however, uh, the global crisis was a rude shock. The rules did not perform and still not, not yet performed as was expected. Uh, we're back to tinkering with the rules rather than looking at the experience. And tinkering with the rules, we say, what is, what is logical? What makes sense? Um, okay. Similarly, uh, I, I think I skipped something. Uh, Performance-based budgets uh, are inherently better in generating results than having line item budgets. If you're interested in results, doesn't it make sense to look at the results themselves? Outputs, outcomes, uh, benefits, however, uh, effectiveness, however you define it. it it's, it's, uh, you don't need to go further than say, if you're interested in results, uh, performance-based budgeting will, be, will produce better, better, uh, better results. Okay. And uh, consequently, the, uh, the armies of countries which have uh, uh, moved or claimed to have some form of performance-based budgeting have been uh, have multiplied over the years. I might add a third uh, example on the screen. Again, it's uh, highly popular, MTEF, Medium Term Expenditure Frameworks. Uh, according to World Bank uh, estimates, upwards of 100 countries have adopted MTEF. We heard the uh, moments ago from the uh, Nepal experience that it's not been successful. Uh, but who cares about success? Doesn't it make sense to consider the future implications of current budget decisions when you compile the annual budget? Isn't this a better way to do it than simply looking within the 12 months of the fiscal year and not considering what spills over to future years? So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is the logic of MTEF, of performance-based budgeting, of fiscal rules, and also of lesser innovations which have congested the uh, PFM reform calendar uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, now, these innovations were conceived in high-capacity developed countries, but driven by the logic that I just presented, um, uh, 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 low-income countries, lo uh, developing countries, should be uh, on the same wavelength, they should share that logic. And consequently, we have something I'll elaborate later on, the migration of major PF reforms from their point of origin, which is developed countries to, to uh, developing countries. Uh, I, I, I was not at the session where I believe Matt Andrews uh, uh, presented at, at, at your conference, but uh, judging from his uh, 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 excellent and a uh, uh, book which should be read by anybody before he or he launches any PFM reform that uh, 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 experience has been neglected. And uh, when we have faced up to experience, it's been a shower of very, very cold water on some of these reforms. Now, the case for self-justification surely strengthened by the difficulty of connecting results to the PFM process. PFM, after all, does deal with the machinery of financial management. Okay. And if you try to link it directly to results, it's really hard to do so. After all, there's so many other in interventions, so many other factors which determine whether these, uh, these results occur. What we do feed off, however, are rose-tinted success stories. Uh, uh, I'm situated right now in a meeting room at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, across the street is the World Bank. And these are wonderful organizations 
which have sold success stories around the globe. And there are some success stories, typically not as successful as we think, typically stri stripping away all the little uh, 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 asterisks and uh, qualifying points as to whether it's really successful or why it worked or how it worked. And success stories then beat the drums for reason or res uh, dr the driven reforms. We disregard the much more numerous failures. Uh, I wonder how many people, for example, attending this conference or in the development community generally would say, if Nepal failed in introducing MTEF, maybe we should think twice or three or four times before we go down the same path. Instead, what we're most likely to do is to look at the success stories rather than the rather than the failures. However, I do believe that experience is a better teacher than reason. I'm not going to disregard reason, certainly should not. We organize our war lives accordingly. When it comes to the hardcore issues of development, reason is really important. And the best uh, experience is important. And the best place to start with learning from experience is to recognize that at one time, every developed country was a underdeveloped country, a country undergoing development. Every one of them had pathologies and shortcomings, which would be recognized in, uh, in low-income in low income countries. Okay. Okay. But they took developed countries, the countries which had now developed, took a different PFM path than the reason-based approach promoted by developing countries. They had, as we know, control-based public management systems, operated under external controls, which meant that at every point in the process, you wanted to hire, you wanted to purchase, you wanted to travel, you wanted to engage in any activity which uh, generated expenditure of public funds. The agency that would spend the funds had to seek and obtain approval from a central authority. This is a form of external control of major expenditures. Okay. There was very little performance information in their budgets. As a matter of fact, I think that before we uh, anoint any young people, graduates out of public policy or other program economics, to go down the path of PFM, ask them to spend a day looking at the actual budget statements and documents of countries which are now regarded as advanced 75 or 100 years ago. What you would have seen a page after page of itemized inputs, not even interrupted by a single word of explanation of how many children will be in school, what the graduation rate will be, what will be the teacher-student ratio, or anything like that. These were financial statements locked into, laser locked into inputs. Yet, despite what we today would regard as a fundamental shortcoming, the, the, these countries which then were undeveloped built modern education systems. They took transport from roads which were muddy and unpassable to roads which are highly modern and uh, allow a higher speed than the police officer who uh, uh, stops me uh, uh, appreciates. Uh, they boosted life expectancy by decades. They lowered uh, infant mortality. They established <coughs> the income support programs and many other programs that today are the identifiers of what a highly developed state is. Okay. Now, how could they accomplish this without paying attention to budgets? How could they accomplish it uh, and yet have fiscal prudence? I might add to the list that during this period of time, in country after country, that then were underdeveloped, now developed, they had balanced budgets. They didn't have fiscal rules. They didn't have formal constraints. But they balanced the books. They didn't have MTEF. They had annual year budgets. Go back to the history of budgeting, whether it's Renee Storm 
in his first work, Le, Le Bouget, in the 1880s, or uh, uh, the codification of budget principles in the 1930s. And he found annual, annual budgets were regarded as a principle of good budgeting. Does it mean that they disregarded the future? They were building the future through the building blocks of, uh, of annual budgets. They accomplished these results because of compliance and control systems, because of input-oriented public management, not despite them, but because of them. And this is the key argument that I want to make for thinking about countries undergoing development. How could it be that tradition-based uh, PFM systems actually contributed to development? And the answer, I believe, is because these systems embedded the norms, the habits of public service and rule-based public administration. They created cadres of public servants to provide public service. They established norms and habits that then got formalized in public financial management. It is an absolute mistake that you can take the formalized, the hyperforms, hyperlized formalities of new public management or of a current uh, modern PFM and impose it on a country which operates under a different set of informal rules and norms. It doesn't work. So what I'm suggesting is that developed countries develop because the process of input controls, the process of following the rules, the process of preparing and implementing a budget, the process of spending only what was authorized in the budget, and not more than was authorized in the budget, took governments from the, being a domain of having informal practices to formal practices. It enabled governments to migrate from external control over an extended period of time to internal control, by which in this context, I mean that the spenders use their own norms and systems in order to maintain public finance on an appropriate path. So in other words, governments perform because public leaders, managers, public employees, politicians, senior managers, rank and file employees, uh, cared about uh, whether the children were learning and roads were passable and the country was developing. This is an argument, by the way, that I made about a decade ago in, a, in an essay called The Performing the performing uh, uh, state. Um, now, if my hypothesis is right on the previous screen, you have an obvious objection. If control-based, input-based public management was so good, so effective, enable them to develop, why did they migrate then, or try to migrate to advance uh, PFM reforms? based on outputs rather than inputs, based on results, uh, based on uh, medium to longer terms rather than a single year. Okay. Okay. Why did they do it if they, had, if they were so successful? Okay. And I believe that uh, every country has its own story, uh, but they embrace PFM reforms for different times and some possibly for different reasons. Some countries led the PFM parade, others were followers. Some overhaul their public administration, and then uh, uh, in the course of doing so, they uh, modernized PFM. In other words, PFM was part of a larger uh, uh, agenda of reform. For example, the public management fits that explanation. Others, however, uh, grafted selected reforms onto traditional administrative uh, practices. They moved according to different drivers, but they moved. And the last bullet in the screen is, I think, the most compelling explanation for why what once was good enough in public management, public financial management, was no longer deemed to be good enough. The process of development itself generated higher expectations for good public services, especially with regard to diverse, serving diverse populations. Government had to face issues 
which it did not face before. Okay. It's one thing, for example, to lower infant mortality from uh, 40 percent of, of 40 children per 100,000, 1,000 uh, live births to, let's say, 10 per live births. Going the last mile from 10 to zero proves that to be much more difficult. In other words, it was the marginal challenge that was left over after countries that developed that in part inspired them to try to transform a, a public, uh, a public financial, public uh, financial uh, management. I skipped too many uh, uh, things, but something else happened that inspired them to move away from central uh, control and ex external control. Government grew. And as the size of government grows, the, uh, the uh, uh, logic of control no longer works as well. The inputs, the line items recede in importance. Okay. Um, imagine, go back to what I suggested earlier, that you pick up a budget document from a, a, a country that today is highly developed from 100 years ago. And it was a reasonably sized volume. Try to pack all those line item data into a volume today, it would fill a room. Government has grown, okay, and the process of growing itself actually leaves questions. What are we growing? Well, what are we accomplishing with the growth? And should we grow anymore? Now, I believe in addition to these, it's not accidental. In other words, growth and trying to uh, uh, solve the, the, the remain, remaining problems that growth led, led. But it's not accidental that the contemporary PFA agenda was formed in the late 20th century. And three situations converge in the late 20th century. A slowdown in economic growth and an expansion in the relative size of government. That's number one. Number two, the uh, emergence of strong resistance to tax increases. And finally, a trend which is still underway, declining trust and confidence in public institutions. These three factors uh, not only converged in time, they also converge in logic. Okay. Um, okay. Um, developed countries uh, ex experience economic growth for uh, um, averaging 4 to 5% a year in the period after World War II. Okay. That was the golden age of developed countries. Um, that made it easier to produce results by simply spending marginal resources. There was an interesting uh, financial contract, implicit contract, between citizens and government. Economic growth created dividends. The government took a share of those dividends, spent it on public programs, and citizens, taxpayers, got the remaining share in the form of higher disposable income. Everybody gained. As long as that growth continued, you had a weak interest in what are we getting for our money. Okay. Second, related to the slowdown in growth, we had emergence of, of resistance to further tax increases and to, uh, and to uh, uh, enlarging the size of government. It's remarkable how easy some countries, quite a few of them, moved from a 10 shares from, from, from public sector spending in the range of 10 to 20 percent of GDP to the range of 40 to 50 percent and higher GDP. It was almost like there were no barriers to that growth, no, no, no political impediments to it. As I said, it happened because almost everybody was better off. And economists would say governments actually, through a co cooperative economies, achieved Pareto optimality. Okay. Once slowdown of government occurs, people begin to resist tax increases, because after all, it's not out of 
a rising disposable income is out of constant and sometimes declining disposable income, and also resistance to to uh, expansion of government expenditure. And all of this is associated with a movement which many of us are concerned about, declining trust and confidence in public institutions. Fairness dictates that I indicate that this decline in trust and confidence cannot be related uh, to uh, budget and financial matters alone, because it pervades many other institutions in society, uh, including non-public institutions. And consequently, uh, uh, there must be some other powerful forces underway. Uh, but considering them is clearly beyond the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the side that this uh, uh, this uh, conference. Okay. So finally, uh, uh, and notice therefore what PF uh, innovations did. I said describe them as rational before. You would say they focused on results. I would say in the last bullet on the screen that they were constrictive in an environment of scarcer resources, lower growth, weakening trust and confidence. You want to tie the hands of government rather than empower government. So what do we do? Uh, uh, we tied the hands of government. We tried to tie the hands of government to fiscal rules. Do not spend or borrow in excess of pre-targeted levels. We introduced MTEF, which said, don't simply look at the year ahead. You must take account of impact on future budgets. And if that impact is not right, you cannot proceed. And finally, government should not spend mon mon funds on low performing activities. That's the uh, base budgeting. You don't trust government. You have scarcity of resources. You want limiting uh, 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 innovations, not empowering innovations. I know the people in the audience are saying I got it wrong, that these are empowering, but put yourself, since since the title over the conference is budgeting the real world, actually as somebody who's sitting at a table in an office and assembling a budget and ask them whether this is constrictive or, or, uh, or, or, or empowering. Now, uh, unfortunately, I must uh, notice that the uh, um, that the uh, greens are, are not in the proper order. So I'll go back to what I just skipped. Okay, and now I, I now I want to move to. I've been concentrating the last few screens on what happened in developed countries. Now look at the migration to less developed countries, and uh, uh, this migration is underway. It's uh, it's what uh, the donor community excels in. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's understandable that developed countries are developed. Let's take off the shelf the toolkit that they use in order to achieve, uh, achieve development. Uh, and therefore, we promote uh, good practice or be best practice. And some of these are codified in, uh, in diagnostics, such as the uh, IMF uh, uh, code and uh, good practices and uh, 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 more, more prominently even in the PIFA, in the PIFA diagnostics. Okay. Uh, and this yearning to imitate uh, the practices of, uh, of developed countries is especially with regard to delivering developmental results. Okay. But the effect, however, is to ignore both the lessons of how countries develop that's the lessons I tried to deal with in the previous screen, and critical differences between high and uh, and low uh, and low developed countries. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, and I might say um, something that we now take for granted in the development community that this uh, impulse leads us to disregard political and institutional barriers to results-based uh, public. Uh, public management. Okay. Now, it would be futile to say developing countries should undertake a long process of development, build formal institutions, have reliable information, uh, organize the basic structure of government on a sound basis. Uh, that takes perhaps decades. And only then, after basic capacity is well established, moved on to a PFM uh, agenda. 
I don't think we'll have any any countries or donors enthusiastic about that. So we have to find out how to learn a bit from development itself and to uh, jumpstart and accelerate the process of PFM results-based budgeting. Okay. And keep in mind that development itself is about results, most critically about a future that is better than current conditions. In other words, embedded in the very word development is results. Embedded in the very word is, is a future. Okay. And therefore, this is, I, I mentioned this because these are the things that PFM reforms are trying to do. So a PFM agenda is essentially a, uh, a, uh, a development agenda. Okay. But it has to be based on experience rather than on the re reasons that I mentioned earlier. So let me go back to the screen that I uh, that I skipped. And I'm going to suggest uh, basically just a couple of ideas. And uh, I noticed uh, that they were touched on in the uh, Auditor General's uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, first of all, modernizing EFM is not a sure route to improve, improve development. You have, it is possible to have grade A systems Dirty fiscal rules, solid MFs, performance-based budgeting, so much more, and the country's development is, is stalled. There are many intermediating <laughs> factors between PFM procedures and results, especially, especially uh, the word there is, is uh, uh, I apologize, is a spelling error. That's not normal institutions, it should be formal institutions, formal institutions and behavioral norms and the interests of policyholders. In other words, politics and uh, public administration uh, intervene. Okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> focusing on results when budgets are allocated has greater prospect of enhancing development than taking with the PFM machinery. What really has surprised me in my experience, limited to compared to other people like the ODI community, but still experience with countries undergoing development, uh, yearning for results, and modernizing PFF, modernizing PFF. That the simple process when you assemble a budget of asking a question, how does it help or harm poor people? Does it actually improve what's happening in the schools? Does it mean that the clinics are, are better stocked with medications? Are the roads more passable? Okay. These fundamental results questions are not asked when, the, when, when budgets are assembled. We hide under the rug or the skirts of performance-based budgeting to formalize them. But there's no substitute for somebody in authority taking a budget decision to say, is it pro-poor or not pro-poor? Who gets these services? How accessible are they? What is their quality? In other words, as the title of the screen says, focus on services. Uh, it is services, which we usually call outputs, and they are subordinate to outcomes. After all, the, 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 we're interested in the conference and development outcomes. Services are the number one key for linking resources and results. Keep in mind that resources services are the link between citizens and government. It's their common language. That's what they share. A citizen wants to know, was there a teacher in the classroom? A citizen wants to know, did my child have a textbook uh, to, to keep up with the, with the, with the, with the uh, 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 school uh, 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 plan, learning plan? That's the questions we should ask when we prepare a budget. Okay. And it is possible to link the quality of services to budget allocations in the ways that outcomes and impacts cannot be, cannot be linked. Okay. Uh, and so uh, uh, this is what we should, uh, this is what we should, this is what developed countries did when they developed. Okay. Put yourself in a country which today ranks in the upper quadrant 
in HDI, the upper quadrant in G GDP per capita, in the, in the upper quadrant in PIFA scores, you name it. But once they were in the depths and they were building communities with input-based budgets, as I said before, those were the questions they actually routinely asked. Is there a teacher in the classroom? Are they learning? Etc. Asking the question is better than having a form that provides answers that you don't look at. Now, a services first strategy does not ignore outcomes, impact, the value of findings, etc. Okay. But the natural habitat of these strategic questions is outside the routines of PFM. You ask these questions in PFM, you get fights over definition. You get stuff you won't use. It's it's PFM hubris or reform hubris that says that we have to fold these into the machinery of public financial management. It doesn't work compressing them into the congestive processes of PFM and the routine time frames of budgeting drains them of strategic value. There are so many other processes by which government can stand back and learn from what's going on, whether it's evaluation, whether today it's a, it's a, a, a long-term plans, et cetera. Okay. Don't try to load all of it onto uh, uh, the budget. Okay. So services strategy pays attention to inputs, which, by the way, is the real world of budgeting. Okay. And what they do in developing countries, whether they acknowledge it or, uh, or, or not. I'm going the wrong direction, and I'm going to look at the last uh, slide. Okay, uh, last set of slides. And there's one other thing we should recognize. Budgeting in the real world is incremental. That is, we look at the marginal change in spending or what we're going to get for that spending over some future time period. It's always been a, 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 a something that we have difficulty accommodating into our PFM framework. But I want to suggest that the long war between budget reform and incremental budgeting will end only when reform is acknowledged that incrementalism has won. Now, if we acknowledge that incrementalism has won, it's a major victory for us, because then we can ask, how can we use incrementalism in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in budgeting. Now, I might say that the first third bullet on the screen, that in some ways we have implicitly acknowledged that imp incrementalism has, has, has won, because that's what baseline budgeting or forward estimates do. They build future budgets off, uh, incrementally off the current budget. And that's what MTEP implicitly does the way when it reor tries to reorganize the, the budget process. So why don't we go further and recognize the following? That's the last bullet on the screen. Incrementalism allows us to do something we should learn the first week in Economics 101, that economic decisions rest on marginal analysis. Every budget reform which is successful must rest on marginal analysis. Okay. And that recognizing that we're dealing with the increments okay, enable us, enables us to more effectively link resources and, uh, and, uh, and results. It is very easy, by the way, to reformat budgeting into a statement that says, what are the marginal resources and what are the marginal results that we would, that we would, uh, that we would get? So I believe that, that combining this with the services strategy would help. Now, you might ask a question. What about wasted stuff? What about not the increment, but the base? What about the, the, if the increment is 5% of total spending next year? What about the 95%? And I want to fall back on the comment I made just a few minutes ago. There are other processes outside the machinery of PFM 
which do a better job of looking at 95%. Bending reviews, uh, uh, program evaluation, impact uh, uh, analysis, outcome measures and indicators, evidence-based uh, decisions, all of them are important. All of them can be fed into budgeting. We're trying to squeeze them, as I said earlier, into budgeting won't get, won't get you very far. So I apologize for speaking too long, but I, I do want to suggest that this is a case where trimming the sales of reform will enable us to sail into uncharted territory. Thank you very much.